Good afternoon. It is Monday, February 28th, the last trading day of February. Tomorrow is March. Ides of March, traditionally a lot of volatility in the world historically. And I guess, you know, the markets right now, folks, they, it looks like that volatility has come a little bit sooner than March. All driven a lot on what's going on in the Ukraine. That has definitely been the headline since we talked last week. Um, and we're going to bring that in as a group and discuss it. Some of the slides that people saw last week are kind of uh, brought them back in just to kind of relay what's going on. Um, I do want to show you right here the map on the left is essentially approximate locations of strikes and attacks. The yellow is where it happened earlier. The red is obviously in the last 24 hours. And you can see we are seeing stuff in the north, a little bit in the east, but in general, kind of in the south. But this graphic on the right kind of gives you an idea where this invasion of where Russia held troop movements are. And as you can see, it's coming in, you know, around the two thirds of the country. And that's what everyone's a little bit worried about. Where does that mean and what does that mean as we go into the production of next year's crop as well as harvesting next year's crop? Uh, you know, right here is where Ukraine corn is produced. So you can see, you know, where this where they're coming in at from the northern part is where some of the bigger Ukraine corn production lies if they would continue to go south and try to take control over that. When you look at the bean wheat production, it's a little bit further east and south. I'll bring it back up here. Where this is, where they're coming in right here, which is not quite the re wheat region, but they are pushing into the wheat portion of Ukraine's production. And then we look at sunflower seeds. You can see it is also in the east. So, you know, as these troops continue to push further and further into the situation or into the Ukraine, I think it's getting more and more unpredictable about what's going to happen. Um, you know, I guess I'm going to bring the group in first for the first discussion real quick. Um, when you look at this, guys, I mean, I think the question a lot of people and my customers are asking is, what do we think? Are they going to be able to get this wheat out? Are they going to be able to get the corn crop planted? Are they going to be able to get the sunflower seeds planted? It's a situation that I think is very, you know, it's going to take time. Now, I think personally that the market kind of changed, viewpoint changed dramatically from going home Friday and then coming in out of the weekend. I mean, going home Friday, I know I was reading some comments that they thought this thing may be over with within a week. The Russians would take control and then install a puppet government. And this thing, you know, maybe we get back to normal relatively quick. My personal opinion is I don't think that's going to happen. And I think this is kind of graphic as to why. The Russians have roughly pushed more than about half of their 150,000 troops that have around into the country right now. Okay. But to kind of get a visualization of the size of Ukraine, think about it. It's essentially about the size of Texas. So you've got a country, Russia, pushing in about 100, maybe 150,000 troops. It sounds like a lot, but this is an interesting graphic I saw over the weekend. Uh, Michigan, the big house, you know, that seating capacity is roughly around 107,000. Um, in big games, they can push up to 115,000. So you think about this, folks. This amount of people right here, in theory, is going to control this, this a state or a, a ground the size of Texas. And I think that's going to make it incredibly hard, potentially, to get this crop planted, harvested, and just moved to market. You know, there was a story out on Bloomberg last week before this even started that banks had already started restricting financing and commodity movements within Ukraine. Some are having a hard time even paying for stored grain, let alone trying to crop, plant this year's crop. So, you know, my viewpoint is I think that's part of the reason why the market rallied today is the market is a little bit fearful of, you know, how much grain is actually going to be produced in that part of the world. Um, that's my viewpoint. Anybody else want to give their viewpoint? How about Matt? You know, I, Jim, I talked to a couple of producers that I've uh, been on webinars before with. Uh, from Ukraine and the, within the next month to two months, they'd like to have their spring wheat and then corn planted in that part of the world. And they said, basically the way things look right now, of course, there's no way they could do anything. 
Um, you know, but <clears throat> in the grand scheme of things, they think that things will actually get uh, normalized. I, I don't know if, if uh, I don't know what the new normal is going to be, uh, but they feel like they'll have a shot at getting this uh, crop harvested and then planted once again, uh, because, you know, they've got several days to work with yet. But there's no question that it's going to be more of a dicey situation than we've seen in quite some time, especially given the uh, export uh, situation we've got coming out of the Black Sea. There's no question that you start to cut that back, uh, however much, 20, 30 uh, percent, let alone uh, depending on Mother Nature, there's no no doubt that it's going to highlight uh, what's going to happen in the exports, which is probably going to be U.S. is going to pick up a fair amount of business. And uh, I do think that if you start moving towards some of these countries stepping in that you usually buy from the Black Sea region and buy from the U.S., I think that you could see quite a volatile situation, especially when you're looking towards wheat and corn. Yeah, and just bring up the exports. I flipped the I flipped the slide while you were speaking, Matt. Um, you know the Ukraine ports. The, the the you know essentially the Maritime Administration that controls the exports or the, you know the shipping out of Ukraine came out to say they are going to stay closed until the Russian invasion ends. Now I'm not sure what that exactly means. Does that mean Russian troops out of the country? Does that mean a stabilization? But it's something that I think it's definitely something we need to keep an eye on. I know the JSA guys had pointed out today midday that the barge freight rates were were going higher today, and that would suggest to me that we probably are seeing at least some of this demand get shifted around as, you know, they cannot get this grain out. I know a couple of ships have already been hit by missiles. I know the talk today was like, if you want to insure a ship, even coming out of the Black Sea region, that would cost you a couple hundred thousand dollars. So essentially, economically, it doesn't make any sense to buy grain from the Russians, even if the Russians were able to sell it. Um, there is an interesting point in this article right here. They say there's about 100 foreign flagships that are blocked in the Ukraine seaports right now. The Russian army's not letting them out. So, uh, you know, right now, they're interesting enough, you got about 100 ships that right now can't move grain, no matter even if they wanted to. So it is kind of an interesting situation. Um, I'm going to bring Bill Biederman in. Bill, what are your thoughts on this? Sorry, Jim, I was on mute know. there. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so if you look at the map, they've got the river coming down and that Mykolaiv or Mykolaiv or however you pronounce that, that port and then the Odessa port, that's like 80% uh, of the, so you see Odessa and then you see that you know, this one doesn't really show the river, but it's just to the west of that um, of that town with the uh, KRY. Right. Yeah, that that one sh shows it. Okay, these so are your that, big shorts. These are the shorts. Yeah. There you go. The mm -hmm. Michael, I, the the Michael, uh, mm -hmm. however you pronounce that, and then the Odessa. Those those two ports are the two main ports, and they're saying that uh, those ports are going to be closed effectively because just of the freight coming out of there it's like six digit cost to get a vessel in and out of there just with the insurance so it just looks like it's going to be shut down and i was talking to wayne parman from grains of truth about it today he doesn't see that changing even if russia even if even if ukraine hands the keys over to russia uh, then he thinks all of these um, sanctions and the ability to move money around are going to be applied to all these ports and it'll just essentially shut down everything. The only exception of that will be like these um, sanctions uh, right now currently are excluding energy export sales uh, out of humanitarian concerns. They may exclude food. And if they do that, then for our markets, in all practical purposes, total supply is available. And that would be very bearish, in my opinion, compared to what we're expecting. Because right now- Well, the way, the bill, the one thing though, just the question though, they could exclude it, but you still got to get a ship guy willing to go in there and not get shot out. Well, that's right. See. And, and I think I mean, the, because, the insurance is still going to be extremely high. So, but I think the perception mention, would be, you know, they can still ship out Energy, well, look at crude oil. I mean, yeah, it's up, but it's not, it's it's at the lower end of the range, not the upper end of the range. And that's the kind of action I think you'd see in grains, despite the reality that you can't get a vessel in and out of there. 
Um, so I think that's a big deal um, and it'll affect the way we trade. Um, I want to show this map real quick. I like I wanted to mention it. I know Brian and I were talked about this last week, folks. This is just kind of give you an idea where what grows where in the, the Ukraine. This actually came from the uh, Wayne Parm and Grains of Truth that Bill was mentioning. You know, just to give you an idea, you know, this, the line between the blue line, uh, essentially just a little bit north of Kiev, a little bit down to the red line. That's essentially like you're looking at Chicago, Central Illinois kind of planning window. So. Just to kind of get an idea, folks, as we're discussing what's going on with the war over there and how long this may or may not drag on, you know, they're essentially their planning window, their harvesting win window for the wheat, their planning window for the United States, their, their planning window is essentially the equivalent to like the United States. So, uh, you know, when we're planting, they should be planting. If they're not planting, it is going to make it an interesting situation. Uh, Bill, I'm going to bring you back in. You had two other graphs you wanted me to show. Um, this is the first one. Uh, the U.S. Black Sea wheat exports, and then the other one is um, the corn exports. What exactly did you want to point out with those two? Well, I want to point out this. I mean, if you look at this graph, the, the, the yellow line represents how much wheat is exported by through the, through the Black Sea region, basically Ukraine and Russia. Um, <clears throat> they make up 30% of the world's export supply. So essentially shutting down those exports, I'd like to say it like this. Now, this is more emotional statement, sensationalized than what reality is, but this would be like having a drought and wiping out 30% of the world's supply, not just the US, but the world's supply. Now I say that sensationally to knock everybody in the side of the head with a two by four and realize this is a big deal. This wheat market, should be trading higher and should move higher based on that kind of a concept. But if you remember back in the 80s, of course, many of you guys weren't trading back in the 80s, but in the 80s, we had 3 billion bushels of corn sitting in the United States in, in storage. It wasn't available to the marketplace because it was in a long-term grain emergency reserve program. So it wasn't available unless we got to a certain high price. But the fact that it was there limited the market's ability to go up, even though it wasn't available. So I'm going to call this a non-available supply. It's sitting there. You're not going to be able to get your hands on it. It's, it's, it. it removes it from what we can trade as a tradable supply. So it is like a drought, but it isn't because it still sits out there like a black cloud. How do you trade that? How do you put that together? You got to be bullish, but you can't be crazy overly bullish. We're not going to go to $15 wheat. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And it's the same in corn. Here's the corn situation. Uh, they make up 38 million metric tons, 17% of the world supply. Can you imagine if, if we lost 17% of the U.S. corn market, what that would do? Um, and so until that supply becomes available, it's gonna have an underlining bullish tone to price because just from economic value, you remove that supply from the marketplace, the market needs to revalue higher, but it's also gonna be potentially very bullish to spreads because we're gonna, the market is gonna have a job to get that wheat and corn out of the farmer's hands and into a merchandiser's hands so he can make it available. Okay, it makes sense, Bill. Here's one question for you. What do you think that does to the bean oil and the veg oil? Because like I said, the Ukraine obviously is one of the biggest producers of, of sunflower seeds. Russia's number two. Interesting enough, Russia exports more. But like I said, I understand that makes sense to me. You know, the wheat's there. They may not be able to ship it for six days, six weeks, six months, but it's there. But what do you think of how this affects the veg oil situation? Because essentially right now, if you're not producing veg oil, you can't make up that lost production. I mean, if the plants aren't running because we're at war, what does that do to the veg oil market? Well, that is one bullish factor that is not, it, it, it's not a, okay, you know, let's debate this. There is no debating. That's bullish. Now you combine that with Indonesia and India and these other Asiatic uh, areas that are increasing their biofuel dependence on that. That's flat out 
bullish. If you look at the quality of the soybean, we've all seen those pictures of sprouted green, rotten soybeans down in, in South America, Brazil, being that were being harvested and moved to the market to the point where we know of some cancellations because they didn't want that kind of stuff. We saw a picture of a dump truck being offloaded with an excavator scraping out the box because the beans wouldn't even flow. They can't even put them in an auger. So you combine those things, this sunflower oil seed production, the move towards a biodiesel uh, program and the quality of beans that are coming out of the South Americans. Jim, I mean, there's just no question. Beans between now and our production, next production cycle, uh, should be extremely well supported on any break until we know there's going to be another good crop coming out of the U.S. That next production cycle, you're not going to know that till late June. Okay, I'm going to bring Brian Split in. Brian, I know we were talking a couple things before we actually hit the record button. Um, I know you're posing a couple questions. I'm just going to have you kind of pose that to the group and uh, see if anybody uh, has an opinion. Yeah, these I think are, you know, we, we can go through uh, how much certain crops are produced in what regions and what the impact of, of exportable supply might be. But um, I, I think there's also another uh, fundamental out there right now, which is the fundamental of, of money flow and uh, uh, credit risk. And so uh, I don't know the answer to this question, but, um, you know, when we see world governments come together and uh, remove uh, Russia's uh, ability to work with the SWIFT system. Um, you know, you wonder if there are potential unintended consequences of, of doing that. Um, and so, as, as I was reading over the weekend, they're essentially messing with, you know, the plumbing of the global financial system. And uh, if they don't think this through thoroughly, there could be some very large consequences. And so, um, you know, if, if we look at, at Russia, um, will they potentially default on foreign debt? And will there be a debt crisis like we've seen in previous years? We saw it in, in Greece, you know, over a decade ago. Uh, we saw uh, a debt crisis here domestically that started with, uh, with Lehman Brothers, and that was in 2008. And, and that eventually culminated into a, um, a mortgage-backed security crisis that, uh, that took the sales out of all of the markets worldwide. Um, and so I, I think that was what was at the root of the trade on Friday, right? So Wednesday night, we have the invasion ongoing. We're trading limit up in a lot of these products. We come off the highs in several of them uh, into Thursday's close. On Friday, we've got things trading limit down instead of limit up. Um, and I, I think you could see this market kind of go back and forth between um, the bullishness of the, the potential of lost exports and lost production to concerns about um, about a lack of liquidity and and debt bubbles popping up. So um, I will pose that thought process. And, and if anybody has anything they want to add to that, uh, please feel free to chime in. Well, the only thing I can tell you, Brian, is I know they were making an art of, you know, it's a debt exposure. Um, the banks, you know, right now they're saying, you know, European, French, Italian banks, they have the biggest exposure, around $25 billion each for one of those. Australian banks have got about a 17 and a half, but comparably, the United States bank's exposure is only about 14.7, with I think Citibank has the biggest exposure risk. So at least as a percentage on the U.S. bank exposure, it's a lot less involved in Russia compared to the European. So if there is a problem, folks, it's going to be the European banks that could definitely take the hit. But as we saw what will happen in 20, 2008, you know, one, ba you know, Bear Stearns, you know, Lehman Brother, you know, Bear Stearns, they all led to the crisis. So one goes, they all go potentially. So it's something we need to keep an eye on. At least that's how I'm looking at it. What do you think, Bill? Oh, you're not going to like what I'm going to say. I, I agree that in all practicality, the sanctions and the screw down of uh, SWIFT is going to be very difficult for their banking systems to function normally. But I'm going to give you some statistics that I have no idea if the accuracy of it 
it, what it is because this is government reported information. But uh, here in the United States, our, our debt to uh, government debt to GDP ratio is at 163%. And we're ranked 128th out of 173 countries. So we're not ranked very well. We're heavily in debt relative to GDP. Uh, now here's where the, the stats become questionable. Russia is only reporting 18 or 17.8% debt to GDP. They're in the top 10 of, of liquid governments. And then Ukraine is kind of in the middle. They've got a 60.8% debt to GDP. They're ranked 93 out of 173 countries. So from a ranking of liquidity, government to debt GDP ratios, the US is one of the worst. Uh, and it wasn't always like that. It wasn't until really um, right at the end of, of the Trump administration when they reacted to COVID and then that got multiplied by a, a gazillion, you know, with, with the, the following year and a half of aid and debt to, uh, to uh, fight COVID. So that's all I know, Jim. Um, my point of that being this sanction thing might take longer to have the desired effect if Russia's liquidity is as strong as what these statistics say. Now, the one thing I would argue on the statistics, though, Bill, just for what it is, you know, to put it in perspective, Russia's GDP right now in 2020, nominal GDP dollars was $1.48 trillion. That's where it was at. Now, to put it in perspective, the United States GDP was $20 trillion, $20.8 trillion. Yeah, you, know, you throw right. in Japan, Germany, and all that, you're looking at $40 trillion. I'm just telling you, you know, the world is fighting them right now. That's the difference, I think. You know, right. Normally, it takes a lot longer, but when's the last time you saw every country since you said you can't fly in? You can't right. deliver anything. I and, mean, there's, I don't think we've ever seen a squeeze on someone's economy like ever, like we've seen right now. Right. And I think you're right. And I think when I say it may not happen immediately or as quick as we think, I mean, I think we're all thinking that these sanctions are going to shut them down within a few days or a week or two weeks. They're going to be going bankrupt. I think it might take longer than that. But I think the fact what you're saying is this isn't just the United States going up against this is the one thing that has been done correctly is that we've got all of our allies on board with this. And so, you know, you've got 30 countries on board with taking down Russia. So I, I think it's inevitable I mean, it'll happen. <laughs> I mean, if you look at it, it's kind of scary, Bill, in my, my viewpoint, but I, I saw this and the reality is, you know, you hate to say it, but it is in a way of World War III. I mean, the fact of the matter is you have Putin troops involved in Ukraine, maybe Belarus coming in, you've got the Ukrainian troops and resistance people fighting it, but the rest of the world's financing it. Right. You so know, there, it's well, almost a proxy war. That, so it is, it really is in a way, World War III, you know, hopefully it doesn't get out of hand, but it is kind of scary that, you know, where we're at with, you know, with how hard of the stranglehold is and, you know, yeah. where this leads, let's hope it doesn't lead anything worse. Well, we're certainly defining the boundaries of who would be on what side if there was a World War III. But let's bring this around to what it means to me and you and to our customers. One is the bond market. The bond market, to me, is going to probably see a fairly substantial rally during this time, which means, high, which means lower interest rates, which is the opposite of what the Fed is wanting to do. But in my, my point is, I, I think with what's going on, they can't create you know, a little disturbance could take a wave and turn it into a tidal wave. And uh, what you were saying about the banks trying to figure out how they're going to stay liquid throughout all of this is true. So the bond market rallies, that's a great opportunity for everyone to run into the bank and borrow long-term money and buy that next farm. Or if you don't want to borrow money and go deeper in debt, just wait for the rally and sell the bond market. All of, the, all of the brokers that you work with here understand that when you sell the bond and the bonds go down, you're protecting a higher interest rate cost. So that's a great money hedge. 
Uh, if you've got a 401k and if you're my age and you don't want to be at total risk, you can be selling the Dow or you can be selling the S&P. You know, a lot of the brokers within our little community here that are on this phone call right now use that to, to, hedge, to, to hedge your portfolio. And uh, you can do a small percent, large percent, whatever. It's, it's very easy to do. You don't have to be right the stock market. The, a particular stock. You just have to be right the general direction of the stock market. And in the grains, obviously, this is giving us a tremendous opportunity to lock in revenue with floor positions. I'm just putting, I mean, this, is, this isn't a recommendation. This is just trying to do things that are in line with what we're saying on our weekend. When Matt Bennett writes his weekend reports, he's saying, get a floor under it. Well, for me, the, the idea that works really good for a couple of guys I work with we're just putting in open orders. We're buying $6 May short dated puts for 15 and a half cents. We got some done last week when it rallied. We're putting in more open orders to do that. Put them in at 640 at 50. It doesn't matter. Talk to the broker, but do one thing. Put an order in because if you don't, you're going to have an opportunity like you had last week to put in a floor. All those orders got filled. And the guy said, who said, call me when it happens. Yeah, right. That order didn't get filled because we never had that conversation. It happened too quick. So get the open order in and live with it. Be happy. Be thankful that you got it. Well, and Bill, to add to that, uh, that thought process, if you think about uh, clients that may have started some kind of a put program, and, and maybe it was while the market was substantially lower than it is right now, um, but they have had the opportunity to throw a little bit more at the put, roll the floor higher and, and keep it uh, in, in, in line with what the market's doing. But with what we saw on Friday, the individuals that don't have a position, if the market starts going limit down and we see moves like Friday, but it, you get two or three days of that in a row, the people that don't have a position won't have a position and they're going to watch the market go right back down again. I agree with what Brian said. And I think what we got to remember is that <clears throat> whenever Brian talked earlier about these risk off days, as a producer, you've got to understand that uh, there's days like today are great opportunities. If you don't already have that floor in to go ahead and start thinking about, you know, where do I want to put the floor in, first of all, because whenever you do have a risk off day, you're going to be in significant, significantly better position as far as your frame of mind is concerned. Uh, my personal opinion is that we don't know what's going to happen with war. We don't know what's going to happen with really with a, <clears throat> much of anything whenever it comes to this war situation. What we do know is that we've got extremely profitable prices at this stage of the game. And one thing we can do is layer in uh, some floors as the market rallies. Uh, try to keep yourself in a very flexible situation, but quantify your worst case scenarios. Because uh, if this market does roll over on us for any reason, uh, we're going to be sitting here wishing that we'd have done something with it. All right. Any other comments? All right. With that, um, we'll wrap up today's meeting. Uh, any questions, please call any of the Ag Market team members at 844-424-675. If you want to make note, the risk of loss of trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Any questions, folks, please don't hesitate to give your broker a call. Thank you.